So, good evening. Welcome. Welcome to our first online lecture series called Materialisms from the heart of Switzerland. It is um, almost getting dark here. It is raining heavily and it's shortly after 7 p.m. Thank you for joining us here in the audience in front of me and on Zoom all over the world. Indeed, this is a very special moment for us, truly engaging with an international community. My name is Johannes Käferstein. I'm director of the Institute of Architecture at the Lucerne University of Applied Science and Arts, short H, uh, uh, HSLU, or in German, HSLU, a bit faster. Dear students, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, in our autumn talks on materialisms, we will discuss issues of space and its material articulations, as well as phenomena of immaterialities, be it through emergent fields of political, social, digital, or ecological changes, or simply by questioning architecture's traditional position within nature and culture. In October, the, this coming October, the curators of the German pavilion of this year's Architecture Biennial in Venice, Arno Brandelhuber, Olaf Gravert, Nicholas Hirsch, and Christopher Roth will refle reflect together with the architect architecture critic Antje Stahl the aspect of materialisms from the year 2038. Following, in November, the notion of immat immaterialities will be subject of discussion between Taishin Shiozaki and Tibor Ionelli, two experts on the work of the mythical Japanese architect Katsuo Shinohara. And finally, tonight, it is our great pleasure and honor to begin these talks from the point of view of material traje trajectories and networks in our built environment with Sarah Nichols from Rice University in Texas, in Houston, Texas, and Kim Förster from the University of Manchester, who will talk about new material histories of architecture. Welcome to both of you. <laughs> My dear colleague Heike Bichteler, who is responsible for curating this wonderful series, not only in this semester, but already in the last few years, will introduce our two first guests. Again, thank you very much for joining us from wherever you are, and I very much hope that you will enjoy this series. Thank you. When architects talk about materials, they probably imply to provide a house with a certain materialistic articulation or maybe also to generate architecture through the qualities of the material itself. This is a very Swiss architectural view and of course a little bit simplified, but I think you know what I mean. And we also know that this view is only part of the truth. By now, we have also learned that it is not enough to only understand the material through its articulation or its capability to become manufactured. By now we have learned that we also need to look beyond the architectural understanding of a material and include a multidisciplinary view in the history of architecture. As architects, we have realized that we cannot only care for the architectural beauty of a house alone, but also take care for the beauty and preservation of our living space because our resources are quite limited. By now we are aware that if we take something out in order to build the house, it means that this, what has been taken out, is missing somewhere else. But I think what we still need to learn is how we can integrate these truisms of material history into the history of architecture and what it could mean for our teaching and also the practice of architects because of course, of course it is not enough to only understand those new relationships we also eventually 
we need to implement them. That's why we have invited Kim and Sarah. Um, Sarah Nichols is an architectural designer and writer who is an assistant professor of architecture at Rice University. Her scholarly, focuses, her scholarly work focuses on building materials, particularly concrete, and uncovers how materials are designed and the relation between conceptions of materials and their use in architecture. She is currently working on a book manuscript based on her dissertation, Operation Beton, Constructing Concrete in Switzerland. Sarah is the editor of Rematerializing's Construction, 22 positions, and together with Marc Angelier, Reform, Essays on the Political Economy of Urban Form. Sarah also works independently as an architectural designer on buildings and urban scale projects. Sarah holds a Doctor of Sciences from ETH Zurich. Her dissertation is a history of concrete that has been nominated for the ETH medal. She also holds an Advanced Master of Architecture from the Berlache Institute in Rotterdam and a Bachelor of Science in Architecture from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Kim Förster is a lecturer for architectural studies at the University of Manchester, where he teaches and researches on env environmental energy material histories of architecture as member of the Manchester Architecture Research Group. From 2016 to 2018, he was associate director of research at the Canadian Centre for Architecture in Montreal, where among others, he di directed the multidisciplinary research project Architecture and for the Environment the contributions to which he is editing as an anthology. Currently, Kim is preparing his monograph on the history of the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies for publication. He served as guest editor for two issues of Candide, a journal for architectural knowledge, and as member of Common Room, an architectural collective which recently has published a book on the eco and solar houses of OM Ungers and is working in a research publication and exhibition project in collaboration with the Galerias Municipas in Lisbon. His current research and publication project deals with the geographies of cement, especially economic, ecological, geopolitical, societal, intellectual, and cultural aspects in relation to its global production. Thank you, Kim and Sarah, for coming and talking to us tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Heike, for the introduction, and also both uh, Heike and Johannes for the invitation. It's really wonderful to be here and also to have the opportunity to do this together with Kim, even when um, separated by an ocean. And it's so wonderful to see people in a room, which is something that I actually haven't seen since March, I think. So I wish I could be there uh, with you, but I'm happy to do this remotely as well. So I will simply get started. Uh, first, I will give a short presentation um, of about 15 to 20 minutes, and then I'll hand it over to Kim, who will also give a short presentation before we open it up more to a conversation format. So architecture, and here are three examples that you all know very well, requires materials, which is a statement that's so fundamental, we rarely consider its implications. Yet even the most masterly, most unique architectural projects in concrete in this case, which is what I'll be talking about today, are situated within a culture of, of a material culture that they are products of and reactions to. But what is embedded in materials? And with this, I mean both in terms of the limestone and the sand, but also the labor and the energy as implied with this diagram. How are materials produced technically, but also conceptually, so as ideas? So here, uh, an image from a publication, which is really trying to, it's showing work in the laboratory on concrete, but also trying to construct a view of the material as something which is scientifically produced. And on the right hand, a diagram that I find quite funny, um, showing concrete, a concrete bunker in this case, resisting at the same time fire, bombs and gas all at the same time as if it can protect from everything. How as well does material and architecture relate to the larger sphere of material use in construction as a whole? So in other words, taking into account also infrastructural uses and this, with this I include airport runways, which are up to 1.5 meters thick of concrete, like the one in Zurich, um, under Luzern, with the Sonnenberg tunnel sprayed onto the face of rock and tunnels or in avalanche protected galleries. 
And to the answer these questions is, I believe, one way of situating architecture in the larger context of construction and also in relation to the environment. So related to our title, I would like to propose that an expanded understanding of materiality that considers the agency and impact of materials from extraction to building and also beyond allows us to understand the history of materials in new ways and also perhaps allows us to ultimately envision new material cultures as well. And in order to address such questions that I began the talk with, I would like to talk about my recent work, which Heike mentioned, writing a history of concrete in Switzerland. Um, and if time permits, I'll talk very briefly about a second project on Baugeschbahn. Uh, as you know, industrialized concrete first appeared in Switzerland in the late 19th century. So here an example of a test bridge uh, at the 1883 Swiss National Exhibition in Zurich, so built out of Stampfbeton and then tested until collapse. At, but then by the late 1950s, cement consumption per capita in Switzerland, which is a good index of concrete use, was the highest in the world. So here you see the, the graph year by year from um, 1880 until 2020 of cement use per year, and you can see this kind of spike in the post-war period. Over this period, concrete went from a material being used occasionally, almost as a novelty in some cases in buildings, to one that is ubiquitous, which it still is, of course, today. And the shift from a new material to an unavoidable material is what has framed this research. And, and what is kind of driving that is a way of finding answers to the questions, how did we get here? How did we get to this point of a material culture where concrete is nearly unavoidable. As a way of addressing this, I trace the establishment of institutions, ideas, and techniques from 1880 to 1939 that I argue make possible the mass use of concrete after World War II and up until the 1973 oil crisis. But to look at a material is also to look at many of the things that have been part of its making. And with that, I mean technical, environmental, ideological, but also the relations between these things. And there are essential things, I argue, that about concrete that happen with its extraction, mixing and pouring that cannot be understood by looking at hardened concrete or looking at the material only in the hands of the designer. So with this premise, I would like to highlight one aspect of my work per material state, powder, solid, fluid, and dust. Actually for solid, I will, I will present two. So first in thinking of concrete as a powder, the organization of the cement industry was a powerful driver for the spread of concrete in Switzerland. Cement industrialists ensured delivery mechanisms and created demand for their product through centralized research and marketing organizations. The cement industry sought new markets and influenced the perception of concrete. Through immaterial means, the cement industry thus perpetuated material demand, meaning they were not just suppliers, which is a term that I find very passive. As the critical uh, diagram shown here, which was drawn, uh, un which was published under a pseudonym Pollux, but drawn by uh, a hydroelectric engineer named Georges Bela, shows the main figures within the cement industry names, which in some cases we still know today, such as Schmidheini, were linked with other material industries as well as key aspects of politics, finance, and construction. So by the time of the post-war building boom, the cement industry was thus a well-tuned operation able to facilitate mass material deployment, making that building boom in some ways possible. Yet, if the industrialization of cement provides one perspective, a history of ideas presents another. In different aspects of solidity, so the, for example, the ability to endure through time or durability, monolithic construction and resistance to disaster, all of these ideas formed arguments that became important for promoting concrete as well as understanding how one can build with it. So by tracing these different notions of solidity over the period of research, it becomes clear that these notions were in fact not solid, but rather they were constantly changing. And unraveling this means understanding concrete in the broader context of material culture. So consider, for example, 
the facade of the ETH main building three decades after its completion as depicted by EMPA, cracking and spalling. To understand why this is happening, it's necessary to look at changes to the sourcing and production of building materials that destabilized the durability of even long used materials like the Ostermundigan sandstone of this facade. Stones were with more frequency being used in unfamiliar locations, processed and installed by tradespeople who had almost no familiarity with them. So this resulting facade of crumbling stone on the Hauptgebäude was thus representative of larger changes to the production and sourcing of building materials. Looking a few decades later, as Gustav Gull was, was tasked with the renovation and extension of the same building from 1909 to 1926, and he chose to replace the stone with concrete, this decision of one architect can be contextualized within both the development of polytechnic knowledge, which was happening at ATH at the time, as well as the way that concrete as a composite material played into changing notions of empiricism by providing the possibility of adjusting the material based on performative terms. So while Gould's extension has been extensively documented, the decision to use concrete has usually been written off as pragmatism. While I don't disagree, I also think that the decision relates to a new system of material values, of performance, as well as of predictability. Consider then as well, the idea of monolithic concrete, which I explore mostly through the example of the Zementala, which I'm sure you know, built by Robert Mayat and Hans Leinziger for the 1939 Swiss National Exhibition. For all the importance that the term monolith had for concrete, different notions of monolith developed that informed different types of monoliths that were based either on performance, procedure, or aesthetics. And for some architects, monolith meant that concrete was a cast material, and thereby literally a single block or something that at least looked like it. Yet for other architects, and as well for engineers, the term referred to the bond between reinforcement and concrete as being so tight as to produce a new material. Finally, for a third group, monolithic referred to structural performance, wherein the forces are transferred across the whole building. And understood in this light that Cementala takes on new meaning as a monolith that showed the incompatibility of these different notions by, on the one hand, embodying the structural monolith, Mayotte's particular idea of it, but by being neither procedurally monolithic because it was composed of a series of layers rather than a single pore, and not representing the weightiness or the, the heaviness implied by a block of stone. So, which is of course the interpretation with brutalism of monolithic be that becomes more important for architecture in the post-war period. For this specific type of extremely thin and also very low tolerance construction embodied by the Cimentale, I also ask what type of building culture produces such a structure? By using the representational nature of the context within the national exhibition, I show how the Cimentale is representative of a particularly close and even actually personal network of engineer, material producer, and contractor upon which such a structure depends. Turning to fluid as a way of understanding how the technical, conceptual, and environmental conceptions of materials are interwoven, concrete um, or mixed with little water or stampfbeton common at the turn of the 20th century was stronger and performed better in the laboratory than mixes with more water. And therefore it was always favored by material testers as they were setting norms. But it was also very difficult to work with. It required a lot of labor. So at the same time, concrete had always been envisioned early on as a poured material, even though it, it wasn't yet. And in order to reduce labor, Wet mix concrete with a high water content known as goose beton was rapidly adopted in the 1920s to take on projects at larger scales, such as the uh, Alpine dam projects, the first generation of really large ones. The first, the new mix was rushed into use on these major projects, but with very little understanding of its performance or durability. And this resulted in a number of project, uh, 
excuse me, problems, including extreme frost damage at the Vegetal dams that were being built by the SBB. So this headlong rush to use wet mix concrete suggests that the notion of flow was so powerful that it threatened to supersede other deeply valued qualities of concrete since it was known to both reduce strength and durability. And as I show um, only, so on the left-hand side, you see an image uh, of workers sinking in to this wet mix concrete. They're nearly up to their knees in the mix. And on the right-hand side, you see uh, this particular concrete mix, goose beton, being used for the St. Antonius Kirche in Basel, which is of course one of the first major aesthetic uses of exposed concrete in Switzerland. And um, this, hints as well that one of the interesting side effects of Gusbeto was that because it was so fluid, it was able to reproduce very well all of the intricacies of the mold. So it gave a much finer surface appearance than something like Stampfbeto. So it takes on from a kind of technical development and becomes also a, an aesthetic question. So other technologies to make concrete flow like plasticizers soon replaced wet mix concrete, allowing the mixes to reduce the amount of water. But in order for concrete to be poured into place, material supply and construction needed to work seamlessly. So supply and site processes had to operate as a whole, meaning that a vast choreography of input flows was needed for the liquid flow of concrete to be possible. And of course, this was related then to the networks established between the cement cartel AG Portland or the Association of Cement, Lime and Plaster Producers, uh, especially in relation to the SBB, allowing them to draw on this national network of production. And to describe this, I, des I studied the development of two dams that were built on the same site in two different eras. The Dixence Dam, built between 1927 and 1935, and the second, the Grand Dixence Dam, which I'm sure you know, built between 1951 and 1961. So what you see here on the left-hand side is the moment where even actually before the completion of the Grand Dixence Dam, the reservoir is filling for the first time, thereby flooding the original dam, which you see di disappearing in this arc in the middle of the water. And it remains there actually underwater, even though it's of course no longer of any use. On the right-hand side, then, extraction drawings from one of the contractors on the Grand Dixence project showing the way that the glacial moraine at over 2,000 meters above sea level was being extracted for aggregate on-site for the production of the dam. And the scale is evident through the size of the um, extractor. So this, the conception of the Grand Dixence project reflected a rupture underway in conceptions of material scarcity. For as large as the Grand Dissence project was, it was only a fraction of a much larger movement of material that was happening at the same time. Both technically and conceptually, I argue that it was part of a shift to a new scale of territorial systemic thinking, using a material treated as though it is conceptually limitless, predicated of course on a continuous and seemingly unending supply of raw materials concrete became a material without limit. And this idea of flow, if it was interrupted with the oil crisis in 1973, which is where my research um, stops, and if this idea is contested from at least then onward, I still don't believe that this idea of kind of unending material use is really a model that we have yet been able to overturn. So one final thing about this project, is that throughout it, I was also trying to find a way to trace the environmental impact of the material, which is really difficult to do in a historical project because many of these things were not concerns as they were today. Many of the issues such as CO2 were not even known and therefore there are no records of them. So what I ended up doing is a brief study of dust in which I show um, how in natural history journals and medical journals, cement and concrete were appearing in ways that show them as environmental actors. And this begins actually um, with a survey of mollusks in the Fjordstetesee in 1899 that could not find any signs of life because the lake bed outside of Rotsloch had essentially been concreted. So a cement plant had opened on the lake 
a couple of years earlier and cement dust was escaping from the smokestack, landing on the surface of the lake, sent, settling to the bottom, effectively concreting it. So the scientists, the marine biologists studying this area could not actually, not only could find no life, they could not even extract a sample of the lake bed uh, as part of their research. So from these mollusks to the hands and lungs of workers in these disparate sites, Concrete was escaping and producing these unforeseen after effects. But the, these things were con chronically, sorry, chronicled only sporadically and in isolation. And so we can only understand the totality of this effect in hindsight. And as I see that I'm already uh, about at the amount of time that I wanted to spend before handing this over to Kim, I will skip uh, my second study and uh, switch over. To Kim. So I have a couple of concluding notes, but I think we can work those into the conversation. Thank you. Okay. Also from my side, um, thank you to, to Heike and to Johannes for this kind of invitation um, to open your series on materialisms together with uh, Sarah and uh, present our work on new material histories. So. My approach to architectural history of materials is perhaps less direct than Sarah's, um, nor do I have a substantial dissertation on this subject. Um, rather, my ongoing um, engagement with environmental histories brings me um, to material histories of architecture, explicitly um, with debates on sustainability and the Anthropocene. So at the outset, I would like to propose um, the Anthropocene, that is our current epoch um, in which humans became the decisive uh, geological factor to be understood as a crucial, if not critical lens to rethink the history and practice of architecture. So my entry point is a bit different. Officially recognized by the Geological Society of London in um, 2016 as the new Earth Age, the Anthropocene poses a challenge in many respects. Um, in the face of the climate crisis and global heating and the planetary boundaries uh, formulated by earth sciences, both epistemologically and historiographically, as well as ethically and politically. Based on the empirical facts alone, as well as in terms of um, critical analysis of the present, it will be increasingly important in the future, um, I would claim, to fundamentally redefine our relationship to the world as we're leaving the stable policy. So the origins and causes remain controversial. One thesis stresses the Industrial Revolution with the rise of Manchester capitalism and the spread of the factory system, installing a new relationship to nature, which led to an increase of the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere by almost 50% since. Another highlights the great acceleration, particularly in terms of industrialization, consumption, and mobility since 1950 on a global scale which shows itself in the interplay of both socioeconomic and our system trends. And the third focuses on cheap nature since colonial exploitation, which cuts across um, cheap labor, energy, food, and resources made possible by the externalization of uh, social, economic, and ecological costs. Geology has been at the forefront um, of formalization and institutionalization um, of the Anthropocene. It has long since become a transdisciplinary issue, though, that is changing the humanities. To illustrate the human influence, the British geologist Jan Salatievich, one of the pioneers, speaks vividly um, of the Anthropocene square meter in relation to all the deposits, especially um, of uh, excavation, mining waste, rubble, concrete, either poured or demolished, plastic, aluminum, and all kinds of chemicals, while emphasizing that there are inequalities worldwide. Sorry, go back. Um, the Anthropocene, therefore, by breaking with ideas of human exceptionalism, also means to rethink our being in the world, which includes ways of building with and living with the relationship to materials in terms of embodied energy and toxicity, the full cycle of modernism, industrial production of materials, and to what extent the history of modern modernity needs to be rewritten in terms of energy, material, and industry. I myself have um, approached material history histories in different capacities through curating research and pursuing research myself through publi publishing and uh, teaching. 
One instance, uh, which I show here, is the multidisciplinary research project, which I directed at the CCA, titled Architecture and for the Environment, running from 2017 to 19. The project encompassed eight researchers um, who collaboratively worked toward um, what environmental histories in the plural could be told from a global, not just European and North American, but also Southeast Asian, African, and Latin American. As part of um, the larger group project, the eight researchers individually focused on single episodes covering various topics ranging from the rise of coal as it became a commodity and other fossil fuels, oil and gas um, mediated through building science and climate technologies. Their naturalization through environmental control system courses and their concealment in building typologies uh, such as the modern skyscraper. The institutionalization of pollution, especially in the case of Ragweed, if nature can be considered the pollutant, up to posthumanist takes, uh, decentering humans through architectural projects by animals and ethnobotanical research on plants. In this re um, context, one of the researchers, Hannah Daru, and I saw Hannah that you are in the audience, thanks for participating. Um, and I have to give, give credit to you since um, I learned a lot from your approach. Um, so Hannah comes from the University of uh, Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, and she was focusing on global geographies of asbestos with regard to the slow violence of building materials. It's extraction, first of all, in Quebec, and in the international marketing by companies such as Etanit, um, for example, through their asbestos journal, um, asbestos cement journal, through case study houses designed for um, architectural historians and for United Nations, where the material was already known for being toxic. In my own research on environmental histories, materials for a long time played a rather minor role. On the one hand, I was studying debates on sustainability before this became international policy and an economic paradigm. Uh, that is the rise of an eco-consciousness among architects and engineers uh, since the 1970s. One case was Umdenken, Umschwenken, an eco-exhibition curated by staff and students of both ETH and University of Zurich, shown in the main hall of Zemper's Hauptgebäude in 1975. A social cultural um, history not just links this to new social movements of the early 1970s, the anti-nuclear protests and um, opposition against the Zurich Expressway when concrete was considered bad. The heterogeneous group behind it ran a public lecture series on ecological thought, organized a solar house competition, and when challenged um, to produce alternatives, put together Umdenken and Umschwenken, which program featured, for example, solar panels that were just entering the market. On the other hand, my approach to material histories of cement and concrete has rather taken place uh, through the back door, since I was following two initiatives promoted by the Lafarge Holzim Foundation, funded by the multinational corporation, while with the merger of 2015, it became the self-proclaimed global market leader, aiming at entering and developing new markets primarily in the global south. So over the summer, I spent some time researching and writing on two related projects, which I would like to briefly introduce, as they touch upon how architecture and the building material industry historically and in a contemporary perspective interrelate, to what extent the geographies and geopolitics of materials have been and are still of relevance and what agency architects um, might have given the Anthropocene. The first text uh, focuses on building materials in terms of the rise, interplay, and dissemination of industrialized production, scientific knowledge, and of financial business, and is a contribution to an encyclopedia which is conceived with the aim of establishing um, elemental perspectives to advocate for solarity, that is, new social and cultural relations on the basis of solar energy. Here I wrote on the kiln in the cement plant next to the steel mill and the chemical works, possibly one of the key technologies that shaped the history of materials in the 20th century. A material perspective is primarily directed towards the vitality and the agentiality of the kiln. If cement and concrete promise to create social unity, to provide for housing and infrastructure, to be the basis for services and a certain standard of living, then the kiln, first of all, burns and transforms matter into material. 
While the cement plant got mentioned in manuals of, on concrete of the 1920s, the classics in architectural history, but also more recent publications on the cultures of the material and the industries of architecture do not pay uh, much attention. Yet with the industrialized production of cement, the kiln has become one of the protagonists in modern architectural pro production and um, in planetary urbanization being the hearth of um, the industrial cement plant, which spent geographies of prairies and mining regions, river power plants and railroad networks, workers' homes and labor organization, architectural civil engineering firms and construction sites. Over the course of the 20th century, the kiln has played an increasingly important role, not only in Western countries, but worldwide, and still does so precisely due to the promises of modernization and development. My case study um, here was the Holderbank cement plant, um, the place of origin of Holzm Switzerland. When the plant was founded in 1912, the first kiln went into operation, the cement market was saturated already and the cement cartel had been founded. What made Holderbank uh, stand out though, was that the entire plant was supplied by the German machine manufacturer Polisius, which uh, first um, specialized in grinders and has since supplied entire cement plants um, all over the world. So industrial um, production meant that the plant in Holderbank grouped all components extremely efficiently around the two rotary columns to form a large machine that allowed for continuous conveying and sintering 24-7 the most profitable production. The cement plant in Holderbank, moreover, became the nucleus of a multi-billion um, francs corporation whose history of witnesses to company mergers and cyclical uh, fluctuations, technical modernization and the expansion of capacity with the post-war construction boom that Sarah talked about, major contracts for water dams in the Alps and nuclear power stations in Argo and Terrassenhuis on the southern flank of the Jura, an anthropogenic uh, form of orogenesis, to put it another way. A decisive factor was the transformation into a financial um, holding company in the 1930s and the early expansion initially into other European countries and increasingly international. While the ubiquity of cement and concrete as a global commodity is guaranteed by regional production, global corporate enterprise has meant that profits have been leveraged globally. The Holderbank plant stayed in business until 1975 before it moved to Zignita. And while the Argo and Jura are characterized by a leading geologist as a deposit of limestone and marl and thus uh, released for exploitation, stayed a faithful supplier of the necessary fodder for the hungry kilns, the quarry left scars in the landscape as recorded in um, aerial photography as early as in 1936. The kiln, and this is what the Anthropocene is about, has another effect because it kills in two ways, to put it bluntly. Um, on the one hand, locally, as the burning of fossil fuels since the 1990s under the, the banner of sustainability has been supplemented by so-called alternative fuels, that is, plastic, solvents, used oil, and car tires. Internationally and at home, cement plants have thus fallen into disrepute as toxic good factories. On the other hand, at a planetary scale, the kiln contributes a not inconsiderable share to global CO2 emission and thus the risk of extinction, which originates um, on the one hand from the burning of fossil fuels and on the other hand from the processing of matter, the rock strata itself, so that the use of solar energy and also the transition to recycled concrete would only make a small difference. The other text is about the NEST, short for Next Evolution of Sustainable Building Technology, a project on the initiative of EMPA, the Swiss Federal Laboratories for Material Testing and Research that we have heard about, and on behalf of the ETH, testifying to how the academe, government, and capital relate today in terms of researching, developing, testing, promoting, and selling sustainability. The NEST was inaugurated in Zurich uh, Jugendorf in 2016 as a pilot and demonstration project in terms of building materials, building technologies, and building processes, a novel laboratory and office building designed by Gramazio Kola to bridge between academia and industry and to accelerate the market introduction of sustainable products. At the same time, the NEST serves as Empire's new entrance and lobby building in the course of its campus experience. As an iconic building, the NEST stands for a reorientation and repositioning of EMPA, 
which next to offering seminar rooms and further education. And the glass covered atrium hall for institutional and corporate events is also pre um, presented to professionals and lay people in public tours. In my research, I was interested in what notions of sustainability are prevailing today at Switzerland's leading institutions. This spring, I myself took a part in a guided tour to learn more about what kind of future imaginaries are communicated by the building itself and by Empress Piardi. So the new building, first of all, is characterized by the integration of two systems of sustainable building technology, an energy system that distributes locally produced renewable energy across the building and a water system with six different fresh and wastewater services both state-of-the-art and regulated by demand-oriented and computer-controlled hubs in the basement. On the other hand, the nest designed as a so-called backbone without a shell functions like a high-end carcass as a platform for building research in the literal sense of the world. So it's EMPA offers Swiss universities and also international researchers the opportunity to plug in a research unit which functions as a living lab. And I understand that the Hochschule Luzern has been involved with a module called Need to Create, with a, which tests new working concepts and at the same time supplies solar power. On the two or two modules were shown, the first is the DPAD house, also by Karma Zucola, who are presenting a three story residential building where they apply their expertise in digital fabrication to two types of prefab construction a concrete construction on the first floor and timber construction on the two upper floors with the aim of saving material through digital planning and automated processes. The second then um, is humor, short for urban mining and recycling by the two German architects, Dier Kebel and Werner Solbeck, an apartment that is based um, on a prefabricated timber construction as an inflow and displays different products in terms of surfaces and insulation, details and furniture, which are sourced from a circular economy, from re reused and processed to self-growing materials. So both research units, the defect powers and humor, address topical issues of what currently is understood by the future of construction. Digitization, if not automation of design and craftsmanship and circularity in relation to materials and economies. Addressed to Swiss builders, homeowners, developers and real estate firms, the NES made promise innovations and profits in construction as it is about a re through um, digitally skilled labor and in terms of custom made solutions and an urban redensification through flexibly designed high-rise buildings. What is striking, however, is that both housing typologies, the single family home and the urban apartment are designed as disposable products and have a short lifespan of just about 30 years compared to 80 years for um, cooperative housing. At a planetary scale, however, the solutions the NES proposes seem not to be sustainable at all. If realized globally, especially since they don't change consumer patterns and the footprints of construction, as is hi highlighted by the Global Atmospheric Watch Measuring Station in the immediate vicinity, which I um, only saw after my visit, a science network in which AMPA has been a project partner since the 1990s. Since the Anthropocene is about redefining our relationship towards energy, materials, and ecology, it remains to be seen what the nest what architecture practice in the future has to offer in terms of design technology and sustainability. As much as it remains to be seen what the architectural humanities in terms of a revision of critical and operative history in theory will turn into. I try to recall how we came up with this title, the new <laughs> material histories. And, and I, I looked up um, our notes um, there was another title in discussion, Rebuilding, Reconstructing Architectural History. I wonder what, what are your recollections on the new? Um, well, I think, I don't remember exactly, but I assume that the intention had something to do with feeling that, um, well, our our understanding of the agency and also the impacts of materials is much more systemic and wide ranging today. And for that reason, um, we need to reconceptualize. And I think one of the things we can talk about is that what we are doing is 
Um, only a very small slice of what I think a number of people are engaging in right now uh, in terms of, you know, things that, that rotate around similar ambitions, which is more or less, if, if to be a little bit overly reductive, reductivist, we could say that the, you know, canonical modernist histories of materials um, they're often very technologically deterministic and very much related to architectural style, of course. But, and then, I mean, one of the, one of the things that I found interesting on, along the way is also that with, with Gideon specifically, um, there are hints of something far more systemic. So he, he talks, for example, also about the um, Umgestaltung der Erdoberfläche, the redesign of the Earth's surface, which is this kind of um, incredibly beautiful and, and I think powerful phrase um, that situates, of course, any individual building, again, within a much larger material movement. Yet, yet these sort of larger observations also about changes to architectural culture that arise with this original modernist batch of material histories kind of get lost in the larger arc of um, of the sort of stylistically determinist argument, which of course we could look at from other from other perspectives as well. So um, Kim, maybe do you want to to take it from there? Yeah. I mean, I also have this as a starting point somehow. Um, we're getting off Gideon and um, this, this focus on construction rather than the material or even the industries uh, behind uh, um, that, that we considered as, as part of the larger geographies. And uh, you mentioned, of course, there's, there's others out there. Um, it's not that we're inventing uh, somehow the discipline, but um, I mean, next next to, to Hannah's uh, work on asbestos, um, of course, um, other um, people like Jane Hutton, um, landscape architect from um, Waterloo in Canada, who was previously in Harvard studying um, um, commodity chains and, and material uh, was hugely influential, um, I think, for my coming to terms with my geographical past, somehow in understanding um, landscapes, how they're built up. And she, in her own work, goes through different materials that make up um, the, the landscape architecture of New York over the, um, I think, uh, 19th and 20th century. So it's rewriting the modern architectural history, which I'm very curious about in terms of uh, what uh, the um, Anthropocene as a lens uh, might, might offer uh, to reconceptualize architectural history. And, um, so somehow um, that is in there. And um, I mean, next to two videos talking about Ungestaltung der Erdoberfläche, which of course was a current topic in um, the 1940s, 50s with conferences, somehow um, consciously discussing uh, resource extraction. Um, I was, for example, looking um, into to Louis Mumford's uh, Cultural Cities and his, his chapter on Coketown, um, where he's speaking about both the upbow and the building, the, the unbuilding and the building combined with regard to the industrial city, um, which I think um, opens up for these new TRPs that we've been talking about, um, how that might impact uh, somehow a different industrial understanding um, of, of building materials and also answer to your question, which I find very important, how we got here. Um, because um, that uh, would open up for somehow um, this not only commodity chain analysis and value chain analysis, um, but um, basically this, this whole process uh, from um, extraction to sedimentation. And um, so I think that um, is, is my take um, on the new end. Of course, it's a provocation uh, to some extent uh, to, yeah. to see. I would, yeah, I would add to that as well. Maybe this is um, a point where we have, um, we have slightly different perspectives as well, because I, what I have presented is historical research, but I, um, history for me is only a part of the work that I'm, I'm doing. So I am, or to say that the reason I was interested in, in doing this as a history was exactly to answer this question that you just brought up again, the how did we get here today? So um, one of the things that I found um, very Im important in 
looking through the historical view was to understand that the material that material culture is there is something it's with it's with a tremendous amount of lag so if we complain that architecture is something that is really slow compared to uh, art then um, material culture or you know material production is something that is even slower and so the kilns for example that Kim talked about the network of cement producers or conventions in construction these are things that um, that take a really long time to to develop and once once they are kind of fixed into place, they in and of themselves become very um, powerful drivers for how things operate. So I'm thinking, for example, of Langdon Winner's text, Do Artifacts Have Politics, which talks about, you know, that somehow when a new technology is introduced, somehow the possibilities are endless, yet the more and more as these things get kind of fixed in that you get, you, you in a way get stuck whether you want to be or not. So for me, one of the important things, and maybe this is also addressing in a larger context why it's interesting to talk about new material histories in relation to practicing architects is that um, is that these these histories create the conditions for the building culture that we are in today. Um, I would like to ask you a question which um, goes um, more into the future than into the past. Of course, you are talking your um, your um, Talk was about history of um, of materials and especially of concrete. But when I think, and actually I can say that I was growing with that material somehow as an architect. Um, but more and more, I have like that conscious to use it. And when I think into uh, uh, to the future, I think uh, the the history of. Um, the material of concrete, for example, but not only of concrete, but will be completely different from now on to the future as when we look to the past. Because of all um, these uh, environmental uh, changes and problems which are related to the circles of, um, of materials and how they are produced and how they are uh, used, especially on construction. So um, I would like to ask you, uh, how do you see the future of concrete? Can I be a bit more polemic? Yeah. Can you hear me through um, yes, yes. the microphone? Quit, um, does, does, the, does concrete have a future? A future? Um, yes, I think so. I mean, <laughs> and I think, uh, well, Maybe to, yes, I think it does, despite all of the, uh, the issues that we all know about it. But I think, um, well, so Karen Scrivener at APFL, for example, has a very powerful pro provocation where she, as a material scientist, goes through and looks at simply the, first of all, the minerals in the Earth's crust and explains that concrete is simply a combination of the most widely available minerals in the Earth's crust. So there is a kind of availability question. And then she goes through, well, what would happen if we replace all concrete with wood? Well, we would need more forests than we have on Earth currently, and all of them would need to, need to be dedicated to wood production. Well, what would happen if we replaced concrete with stone? Well, stone in some cases ends up with a higher CO2 footprint than concrete because simply the act of transporting uh, stone by truck can be so, uh, can have such a high CO2 output that sometimes quite um, counterintuitively it's worse. So. My answer to this is often that I think um, it is quite easy or quite trendy right now, not just within architecture, but I think in popular discourse in general, to point at a particular material in order to say there is something about this material that is uniquely wrong and bad. And I think there are certainly cases in which this is an important thing to say. And uh, Hannah LaRue, if she's still uh, here with us uh, in the audience, I think her work on asbestos cement or uh, etchanide is a really you know, important contribution to that. But con concrete for me is um, the material in itself is not the problem. The problem is the amount of it that we use. And I think what we need to keep in mind is that um, 
every material has consequences. It is not possible to build without there being also consequences that we are not comfortable with. And so for me, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't construct things. It just, it just, uh, it underlines that there needs to be um, more consciousness or, or to put in a broader way. I think what we really need is a kind of new material ethics in terms of looking at, at the materials that we use in, in architecture in totality, in terms of the labor that's used to extract them, where that extraction is happening, what the after effects of that extraction is, be it um, you know, wage theft or toxicity, and, um, and to understand that, that, that that's embedded in concrete, it's embedded in aluminum, it's embedded in steel, uh, and in many cases, it's also, it's also embedded in, in materials that we have also um, an understanding of them being less harmful, such as wood. So wood, you know, if it, it's extracted from the forest in the back of the construction site uh, by the person building the house, maybe, maybe there's very little harm if the, if the timber is replaced. What happens if that's happening on a larger scale with unsustainable forest management what happens when that glue it when that wood is laminated with a glue that is highly toxic and also makes it difficult to recover the material so i think it's a very complex question that that should not revolve around trying to place the blame for um the dark side let's say to borrow a term that mimi shallow uses in her her study of aluminum on a particular material, but to think of our building culture as a whole. And with that, I'd turn it over to Kim. When, when we prepared for this, this talk and presentation and conversation, um, we also talked about uh, what this means for education, for our teaching. Uh, since we're teaching like the historical realms, uh, histories of technology and um, Actually, my field is more the architectural humanities. Uh, um, of course, that opens up. I, I would second um, Sarah's uh, thoughts about um, all those considerations of the material in terms of um, some of the complexities with regard to what is embodied and how that gets embodied. Um, issues of labor that are not talked about, um, especially with regard to cement as uh, considered being the raw material for concrete. Um, so to open up for an industry perspective, I think, with regard to all materials is, is one thing. Uh, but moreover, the, the, the question is, what is the, the overall um, goal objective in, in education? And from the humanities perspective, um, I often claim it's, it's of course, uh, having or providing a historical consciousness, some sort of environmental literacy. And, um, I would add, um, I think today, uh, material literacy and material consciousness, and maybe this is also a question to, to you, Wolfgang and Felix, um, how you approach um, pedagogy in terms of materials, since somehow um, this, this consciousness won't single out one, but what may probably space for a conscious decision how to build, whether to build at all, and I, I would maybe close with two um, two um, instances where it came across considerations of um, like thinking through materials and with materials. One is a recent Hofpater issue um, somehow on, I think it's, it's about carbon neutrality and, and uh, by 2015, but still uh, it uh, looks into architectural strategies and uh, number one strategy is, is to, to really consider uh, when to build. And, uh, further down, uh, not as efficient is, is the question when to build with concrete, and I think that might also answer to your questions. Um, a conscious, um, like dealing with concrete, um, is something where, of course, it's not about singling out infrastructure versus architecture, design arguments versus uh, developmental issues. Uh, although uh, somehow um, Adrian Forty in his book Concrete and Culture closes on this Swiss somehow revival since the 90s and the massive volumes being um, poured for um, the purpose of, of design for architecture culture. And the other um, instance was only yesterday that I learned that now in the US, uh, there's this movement of architects declared climate and biodiversity emergency, which started in the European realm, I think last year, 
where um, I followed a bit about both the, the British and the Swiss case, and um, I went to the American side yesterday and looked at their bullet points. And um, the language is similar somehow, but one of the bullet points uh, curiously addresses this question of claims to be made to the industry and uh, uh, asks for advocate for detailed disclosure of material provenances and environmental impact by extractors, manufacturers, and distributors to accelerate the shift of low carbon, non-toxic, and ethical produced materials, limited waste, and support a rapid transition to secular economies. So this is quite a mouthful. There's a lot in there that is also somehow, um, I think, conflictual um, to some extent. Um, but yet, that wasn't the case with the previous declarations. There's, there's other um, uh, issues um, connected. Uh, the Swiss one talking about ecological and carbon dioxide non neutral building materials, but somehow this, this uh, claim uh, for, for a disclosure somehow is, is a new addition. And uh, so I wonder where, where are we today with this, um, with this claim? And maybe you want to, to um, respond with regard to. What is the objective uh, in architectural education with regard to, to the material use? Um, I think that's the key question. Um, uh, what, how does architecture education react um, on the question of the material approach? Um, and what, what I was going to say is, um, Kim, you uh, were referring to the Hochparter with uh, the 33 points on how to react um, on the future, um, yeah, future problems that, that come and uh, 33 strategies to reckon that. And most of these strategies are like not necessarily really good stories. They all say uh, you have to uh, make less buildings, you have to avoid uh, to produce carbon dioxide, you have to do this and that. And th there, I miss a little bit the good stories behind that. And I think, um, because uh, Johannes was asking, what is the future of the concrete? Um, I think um, the, pr the problem is that the perspective of the changes. If you look at the asbestos 50 years ago, you thought it's beautiful. Because the connection in your brain was, it's a beautiful material, and there was no story about that material that told us it, it's bad. And now, uh, Concrete might be seen completely different in 20, 40 years, so the perspective will be maybe it's not going to be used, but not because of technical reasons or economical reasons, but just because people will change their perspective of the beautiness of the material. And I think that's the most important thing. Can you combine ecological issues, technical issues with a story that makes it beautiful or not, that you, you, Sarah, you mentioned the name trendy, the trendiness of the concrete. Well, that's, that's the thing. Uh, as soon as if something is trendy, people will use it and will create stories and will, will have a new approach to the material and will write a new history on that specific material. And I guess that's, that's the problem. We will not be able to change things in just saying, ah, well, because of ecological reasons, technical reasons, we will have to create a positive, good narrative about a specific material. And that's the, that will have much more impact than all claims about with, with, filled with numbers and, and reasons. I, I mean, I agree absolutely. I think, I, I think as with many things in our society today, a, a piecemeal approach in terms of changing small things is not really going to get us out of the crisis really that we are in today. And also, I also believe that um, positive visions that are exciting and that people want to reach and fulfill can have much more impact than uh, explaining that things are bad and need to be avoided so and this is something that I'm um, that I think can be um, addressed for example through design studios or even kind of um, speculative architecture work that um, can could we imagine telling new stories about material culture that become something that we want to achieve and this for me is is 
fundamentally a type of design, even if it means that we are applying our skill set as architects in ways that are in sometimes unfamiliar and thinking, for example, of can we design extraction in a different way, for example. So at almost every construction site, we are pulling all of this material out of the ground in order to create the foundation and basement. And where does that material go? Is there a better way that we can use it, for example? Or um, also, I think for me, a really key site is thinking about the end of life of buildings already from the beginning to, to think from the beginning about how it will come apart essentially. And this again is a place where I think that his, a historical view is sometimes useful even for practicing architects because what I've seen in my work is that up until the early 1910s or even 1920s, there is photographic documentation of what would happen when a building in Zurich, for example, is, is um, being removed and it was not demolition. People would come and very carefully uh, uh, take out the windows and doors and um, you know sort everything. So you'd have a stack of windows, a stack of doors. You would undo the bricks and the masonry because it was of course a lime mortar that uh, you can dissolve again in water. So the bricks, the stones, the windows, the doors would all be recuperated and, and those things were viewed still as having value and we, we lost that. And we began instead to come in with uh, probably not with a wrecking ball in Switzerland, but at least with a bulldozer. And um, so, so posing again, um, understanding buildings as kind of stores of material, which of course a number of people are doing today uh, I think is, is a very potent site for design right now, as is thinking about the quarry as well and material production as a site of design. And of course, um, this is again, something that architects uh, kind of engage with and then sort of lose interest in, in sort of periodic waves. But I think here you have a good point, uh, but I also think that this is an issue which is very, very actual um, treated for in Switzerland, I would say, right now. I think there are many, many, um, um, also here at the university, many studios which um, try to work uh, with, um, uh, we're actually doing a thesis about um, um, reuse of existing buildings, um, we are talking about upcycling and I think um, this is an issue which, um, which is really now in the center of uh, attention in, uh, in the academic world in, in Switzerland I, I would say and in this sense you could say it's not a problem of material because um, it's, it's much more the problem of how we deal with the architecture and I think there, uh, of course, with more respect and with more um, sustainable architecture in, in general, but also sustainable way of treating architecture in their whole um, life circles, um, I think we can, we can do a lot. But still, I think still, um, with concrete, uh, we will have... Concrete is not seen anymore, or is not... Uh, not, yes, it's not seen anymore as it was 20 years ago. And I think the other question would be if concrete, the, the, I mean the um, production of concrete could change to a more sustainable way that it turns again into a material we can use without having any stomach, <laughs> a stomach problem. And I think there is also something to do that um, it's of course a fantastic material from its technical point of view, a technical and aesthetical uh, point of view, but um, I think it has to um, become also a sustainable material that it will have um, its um, importance in the future of architecture, not in the engineering, I, I agree, but in architecture, I think it will need some kind of technical change to be as important as it was in the past. I don't know if I have a, dir a direct answer to that, but one thing I would point out is that um, we do, and I think Kim and I both did this, we tend to talk about concrete as if it's one material or cement as if it's one thing, 
but actually it's it's many things that fall under the same umbrella even though of course there are pretty powerful norms for it uh, there are still differences and so even for example so i would contend for example that concrete in switzerland is not the same as concrete in india not not just in terms of labor on the construction site or conventions of construction which of course are very different, but even from the very um, basic start of cement, because Lafarge um, Holtzim, uh, now of course, uh, or for a very long time now, an international company producing both in Switzerland and in India, for example, has um, plants in Switzerland that are far more efficient than the plants in India. And we know, of course, as well, of the reports that have surfaced of the labor conditions uh, and so on that further complicate that picture. So in that sense, um, well, we know that Switzerland is an exception in terms of building culture in many ways, right? The, the standards of construction, the expectations of durability. And I think um, even from the side of material producers, there is a um, responsibility within the country that contributes to a different culture of construction than um, what even those same companies are producing abroad, which is a radically different and often far more harmful picture of what construction is. You know, another thing that, that I was very interesting listening to, to you, you said that the dust in here Lucerne goes into the lake and like makes the sediment on the muscles. So that's the, the, that's an, an, a downside of the, the concrete production. And I think what is also very important for us architects is to, to not only design the process of the material until the building is there, but, but also to design its end and its death. And if the death of the material has some sort of beauty in it, it becomes much more, more and more important in the society how things end. Like if we now go outside and see the trees, they are yellow and we, we like it. It's practically the end of the leaves, but, but we seem to like it. And um, if we look at the asbestos, now we know uh, the end of the asbestos is some, some people completely covered and, and with, with machines tearing down these, these things, so the end is very dangerous. We look at it and we see the danger in it. And so I guess that would help materials to, well, to, to have an, a beautiful a death at, at the end. <laughs> or, a, well, a recycling process that, is, that has a beauty in it or has a, some, some in a emotional connection to it. Yeah. Yeah, I think another another thing that's important to important to mention is that there um, there is a big difference between reuse and recycling because recycling implies that there's a second um, energy expenditure in order to reprocess the materials. So it's of course better than um, waste, but it's not quite as good as being able simply to recover the material and probably recertify and reuse it. And what we are missing as well is that recertification um, process. So particularly for structural components, even if they appear to be in good shape, we have no way in terms of legal liability in most contexts of actually being able to use them, thinking, of, uh, for example, like prefab concrete components or steel, steel members. Um, and so I think that, I point that out because I think it points to another site of design as well, which is the role which is again something that architects have played for a long time, of a public intellectual advocating, for example, for different policy positions uh, that would, you know, for example, establish a body that is able to certify these components for reuse. Or I'm thinking, for example, of the work of Rotor in um, Brussels, where they did a kind of amazing study where they saw um, maintenance crews in the city pulling up the curbs of sidewalks and these granite pieces edging the sidewalk between the sidewalk and the street and they saw them throwing them away and replacing them with new ones and they simply asked well why is why is this happening and they found out it's simply because the specification from the city required that these curb elements be a particular length 
And so because of that requirement, they had to throw out all of the old pieces, which were in perfect condition, and replace them with new ones. And this turned then into, I think, a really amazing advocacy pro project where they successfully convinced the city to know, you know, keep the Querschnitt uh, requirements, but change the requirements for the overall length so that those pieces could be reused. You talked about um, Katie Lloyd Thomas' work on specification. That's her take on the industries of architecture, and um, she's kind of this phrase of the architect as shopper. So where um, the industrial product becomes um, key in her thinking of agency of architects, it's not only to accept the product as given, but also to actively shape it. And um, I'm not a trained architect, but I'm very curious about uh, this possibility of, of acting um, within the given constraints of, of specifying materials. And, um, in preparation, I read also Jesus Vasalo's text on, on what you might have come across um, this publication from Trieste Verlag on, on ramped earth buildings, where he basically claims that this uh, might, might change. It's not about uh, some finding this, this off-the-grid um, uh, building that uh, won't serve the planetary population. So, but it's, it's rather working within uh, the given constraints and conditions of, of architecture and trying to, to make a difference by specifying mud again that, um, I don't know, might have never been specified at all. Um, the question is, is, is that a way to, to deal with the material that otherwise would be um, pushed aside. And um, so maybe there's different uh, other examples that, that you were working with, but I, I wonder what, where, where's the agency located with regard to material use and material designs um, somehow? Thank you very, very much for, for yeah. being here, even though you are not here, but still you are somehow here. And I, I really hope that we um, continue this in a different context. And I also wanted yeah. to, to um, thank Wolfgang and, and Felix for um, asking questions. I think that's also as important as giving answers. So um, we will have a beer now. I, I don't know what you are going to do, but um, thank you and goodbye. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.